All right, so I have 1201 on my end. So if it's okay um, with uh, Dr. Espinosa and Dr. Hoffman, I'd like to get us started. Um, since um, we have everyone, probably a lot of you are joining us on your lunch break and thanks so very much. Um, today's um, invited webinar um, is hosted by the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies and also funded in part by the NIU Graduate School, the Graduate Colloquium Program. So we are very grateful to them um, for supporting um, our work at the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies. I am Dr. Christina Abreu. I'm the director of the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies, and I'm also an associate professor of history. Um, and if there's any undergraduate students joining us, keep an eye out because uh, next semester I will be teaching Introduction to Latino Studies um, online. So that might be a course that will interest you. I'm joined in hosting or co-hosting today's webinar discussion with Dr. Mariola Espinosa by uh, Dr. Beatrix Hoffman. Beatrix, I don't know if you waved. There you go. <laughs> so Dr. Hoffman is a professor uh, of history and she studies the history of healthcare in the United States. And uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention that in the spring she's teaching a course that is uh, very important um, and overlaps with our discussion this afternoon. She'll be teaching um, History 361, which is the history of epidemics and pandemics. So if this is a topic that, that interests you, as I would imagine. Um, keep an eye out for that in the spring. So with that, um, I want to mention, uh, I want to uh, introduce and welcome uh, Dr. Mariola Espinosa, who's joining us from Iowa City. Uh, Mariola Espinosa, she's an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Iowa. She specializes in the history of medicine and public health in the Caribbean and Latin America, as well as in histories of empire and disease, race and medicine, and transnational medical practices. Her first book, which was titled Epidemic Invasions, Yellow Fever and the Limits of Cuban Independence, 1878 to 1930, examined the role that yellow fever played in relations between Cuba and the United States. For that very important work, she was awarded the 2007 Jack D. Pressman Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Development Award uh, from the American Association uh, for the History of Medicine. So welcome, Dr. Espinosa. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we had originally intended for Dr. Espinosa to join us um, in person on campus. Of course, current conditions make it so that's not possible, but we're very grateful that you agreed to meet with us in this virtual setting. Very I just happy want to be here. Thank you. Um, I want to just um, talk just very briefly a little bit about logistics. So we're going to treat today's um, webinar very much like a, like a conversation or, or sort of like an interview type um, conversation or dialogue. Um, we're very interested in welcoming questions from those of you who are in attendance. So if you would wish to ask a question, please use the chat function. Um, please use the chat uh, bar um, in Zoom. You can ask a question at any time. Dr. Hoffman, she'll be monitoring um, the chat. And the only thing that we ask is that when you ask your question, um, introduce yourself. Let us know if you're a student, if you're a faculty member, maybe tell us your major or anything like that um, so that we kind of uh, know who it is that's um, asking um, the question. And uh, so to prepare for today's session, we had asked everyone to read uh, Dr. Espinosa's article, Globalizing the History of Disease, Medicine and Public Health in Latin America. And so we're gonna use that a little bit to kind of inform um, our conversation and also to make connections uh, to what is happening today, right? To today's COVID-19 crisis, given the overlap in, in research and whatnot. So um, with that, um, I will begin by asking um, our first question. And that is, uh, Dr. Espinosa, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your research and your teaching? Absolutely. Um, thank you for, for inviting me. And I, like you said, I wish, I wish I could get out of Iowa City and visit. Um, and, but I'm still very happy to be able to share with you uh, here during this, this Zoom webinar. Um, I'm Mariola. I'm a professor of history here at the University of Iowa. Um, my background is that I'm Puerto Rican. I was born on the island. Um, I grew up there. And when I went to college, I didn't really think I was going to be a historian. I started studying in the sciences. Um, that's what people did. <laughs> and that, uh, that's what I was really good at. Um, and I was taking history for fun. 
So when it came time to declare a major, uh, I sat down with all the courses I had taken and I realized that while I was struggling with a lot of the science courses, even though I thought I was okay with them, um, what I really enjoyed the most was Latin American history. Um, and so I declared that as a major and that's kind of how I became a historian. And then when I was looking for a topic for a, a senior essay, um, I had a professor of Spanish literature, Arcadio Diaz Quiñones, who um, asked me, um, well, you know, write, write a paper about, about somewhere close to where you live. Um, and, and he asked me, he's like, what's this street where you live? And that was um, Ashford Avenue. I lived off of Ashford Avenue in, in the San Juan region. And he said, well, write a paper about who Ashford was and what he did. And that's how I became more interested in public health reforms during U.S. empire in the Caribbean. Dr. Ashford was a physician with the U.S. occupation, so he was a military physician with the U.S. occupation in Puerto Rico starting in 1898. Um, and he dedicated his life to finding the cure uh, for what people from the countryside in Puerto Rico were deemed to be suffering from, which was called anemia. But it was a parasite. It was actually hookworm. And he identified the hookworm and all that. And that's kind of how I dove into these topics that complicate um, something that's meant for good, like healthcare, within an imperial colonial setting, um, to kind of see relations of power within uh, actions that are deemed to be beneficial for people. Um, and so I mean, when, I, when I came to deciding what to do after graduating from college, um, well, as friends are going to do investment banking and law school and medical school, I just, I loved history and I loved what I was investigating. And I thought, let me just hop over a couple of islands and see what's going on in Cuba, um, which I don't know if that's the best way to decide what to do for grad school, but that's what I ended up doing. Um, I didn't know much about how grad school worked. Um, and I ended up working in North Carolina, um, diverted the topic a little bit because my advisor didn't think it was a good topic. And then after two years and doing my master's, I convinced him otherwise. And that's how I ended up working with the book that I ended up publishing. Great. Thank, thank you. I, uh, those trajectories are always uh, interesting to learn how everyone's sort of origin story of how you got to, to where you are. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. That is such an amazing story that you had to investigate a street where you live. And that's what started your intellectual journey. I, yeah. I would love to share that with my students when we talk it's, about doing local histories and how that can. It, and it was interesting because Ashford, like Ashford Avenue is like a main thoroughfare in the big city in the tourist area mostly. And there was Ashford Presbyterian Hospital. And then I remember there was Dr. Ashford's house. And when I was in high school, I would walk out to get lunch. We had permission to leave the school for lunch. And, um, and we would walk past Dr. Ashford's house and um, he wasn't living at the time, but his wife was. So he married, he married on the island and stayed on the island and his wife was still alive. And she was, she was bedridden, but you could see her looking out the window. And that just stayed with me. That's so cool. So um, I'm not a Latin American historian, as Dr. Abreu mentioned, I'm a US historian, and my field is history of medicine. And I just want everybody here to know that uh, Dr. Espinosa's work in the field of history of medicine is incredibly important and influential. Another reason that I'm thrilled that she's here today. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about your publications and how they address we see in, in the title of your article that you touch on so many different fields. So Latin American history is, is one, and then there's history of medicine, history of disease, and also something called the history of public health. So could you tell us a little bit about, I guess, what those, how those fields are defined and how your work has contributed to them? That's a big question. It's huge, I know. Yeah. Um, well, I think that it's, it's a lot easier to convey now to people the importance of the history of medicine and public health. Um, it's interesting to, and, and you probably have this experience in your classes where 
you've taught these classes before about history of medicine and you spend a really long time kind of building this framework to explain to people the importance of this. And that in this context that we're all living, people get it. <laughs> and so all that scaffolding you use that takes a few weeks, our students get it right away, right? So it's, it's just kind of interesting to me that in that way, it's, it's a lot easier to convey to people the importance of the work that we're doing. Um, the history of medicine has traditionally been this history of uh, mostly European and US-based medicine, right? So it's starting from ancient medicine or, or, or uh, the classics, Hippocrates, Galen, and the ways in which people understand uh, health and themselves and, and the care that they receive. Um, there's all kinds of different specialties, right? So that you have people who look at medical professionals, a specific, um, specific ways in which uh, medicine itself has developed and professionalized from like just being general physicians and caretakers to um, becoming very specialized like cardiology and, and pediatrics and surgery as like very specific fields. And, and, and historians ex have interest in those and whatever their personal reasons are, whether they live on a street with the name of a surgeon or whatever their experience as they're driven or they're drawn to something that they want to study, right? So it's a little bit personal how you choose what to study. Um, and and so, so when we talk about history of medicine, it's usually that big arc of the large histories of medicine. Public health is more uh, understanding the health of large populations, right? So more of what uh, we're learning more about now through our experiences with COVID-19 is understanding that it's not about individuals, it's about things that affect a community. And the community could be as big as a country or as big as a continent, or it can be as small as a neighborhood. Um, but it's definitely about more than one person and it's something that affects public good, right? Uh, and well-being. And, and that's more... Um, I, I point towards across the river here in Iowa because the College of Public Health and all the sciences are across the river. And the people there study more of these communities and large scales and look at data that give them um, more information about large scale stories. And then, um, and then disease and the history of disease is more focused on possibly the way in which these organisms that cause illnesses affect the body. So you could look at history of disease being about a, the history of a virus, but also look at the history of disease about the ways in which people have defined that and how it affects them um, and affects their society or affects their neighborhoods or affects their culture. So I find them all to be distinct, but at the same time, very intertwined. Um, and, and that's, Kind of how I try to define it to to my students and when I try to figure out how I got to where I got um, because I was trained as a Latin Americanist right so I was trained as somebody who was going to study Cuba and only Cuba and I had to kind of figure out how to become a historian of all of these things. Yeah and I was interested to hear that you do have a science background because some of us in the field of history of medicine don't have any science background at all and are actually really terrible at it. So, I did. I mean, I didn't do very well, um, <laughs> but I, I'm interested in it, um, and I find that it's important when you're looking at these histories to not be afraid of engaging scientists and like kind of don't don't be afraid to use their expertise to really work into your arguments. Like if, if there's evidence elsewhere that maybe is not the type of evidence that you're used to handling, but somebody else is, like use that knowledge and bring it into your mm -hmm. work. But don't be intimidated by it. No, and, and don't think that you have to learn it all either. Like find, find a good collaborator. Yeah, thanks. Those, I thought your definitions were wonderful of those disciplines. So uh, Beatrix, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, uh, I wanna ask a follow-up. Um, so I'm gonna take us kind of away from our planned um, outline, but you've mentioned something twice that, that, I, that overlaps that, that um, has me intrigued. You mentioned um, that you had to convince your advisor uh, to switch a topic and then, and then also to, to allow you to be 
um, that you wanted to think more transnationally, right? Think more about the Caribbean as a region as opposed to being so so bound to, I'm a, I'm a Cubanist and I do Cuba or, or, or Puerto Rico or whatever it might be. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like how, like the, that conversation or that negotiation with an advisor or, or with yourself of how you want to approach questions and answering those questions? I think that it, 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 um, it took a lot of growing up um, and learning what grad school was like. I, like I said, I, I didn't, I'm not first gen, but I had no idea what doing graduate school was like. Um, and, and, and I realized after the fact that a lot of my classmates in graduate school were children of people who had gone through graduate school. So they, they knew what to expect and they knew what academia was like. And I didn't know, I had this idea of what academia was like that I just, it was completely wrong. Um, and, uh, and so I spent two years of a master's researching the destruction of sugar planters in the province of Matanzas during the 10 years war. And I hated it. I hated it. And so I, I ended up with this master's essay, which was very well written and it passed, but I was miserable. And, and I, and I tell my students when I'm, we're looking for research projects, like find something that you love, otherwise like you're gonna be miserable. And so I went to Cuba that summer to do research. Um, and I met with Cuban scholars and I said, listen, like my advisor has told me that, you know, in the past year, I, I feel like I wasted two years of research doing this other um, project. This is what I wanna do, what do you think? I wanna know what Cubans think. And they, they said, oh, nobody's done that, you should do it. So I was one, very mad at my advisor because he was wrong, nobody had done that before. <laughs> But two, I was very glad that this was something that came out of me and it wasn't a project that I got out of him, right? So everything about my work having to do with history of public health in Cuba and the history of yellow fever comes from me alone and the support I received for that idea from scholars that were younger, that were in Cuba and in other parts of Latin America who thought this is really interesting. And through the um, support of historians of medicine that I didn't have in my university, but I kind of, I just emailed people. Like, if they don't answer, that's okay, but I would email them and they would write back. And so I, I created this network of mentors outside of the usual Latin, like with the training was very much like Latin American as Cuban is that's all you're going to do. And I'm like, no, I can't, I can't, right? I can't do that. And I need, I needed those people to support me and to help me kind of show the guy in charge that I could do it. And it worked. Um, the other thing is that like having the experience of being, and this is something that I was able to articulate afterwards. And, and I use in some of my other publications, like, so after my first book, I pull the lens out and I look at the Caribbean as a whole, because I just, it's so evident to me that I just, I, I've seen myself standing at the top of a mountain in Puerto Rico and looking out and seeing the island that's one neighbor over and they're not Spanish speaking, but they're part of the same world. And in history, they were not separated by these linguistic boundaries that we use to train our students. Right? They're part of a world where you can catch radio stations. There's trade, there's tourism going on around all these islands. But when we study them, we just study them within these very strict linguistic and geographic boundaries that seem very artificial to me, having myself been in that place today. And just kind of reading up on the history, I, I, um, I catch on on similar feelings from the experiences of people who wrote in the 1700s about the way they saw the Caribbean region. Awesome. Thanks for uh, sharing that. I think, I think that's um, useful for um, students who are listening in, right, to think about that you um, you can question your advisor, right? And you can, you can, you can pursue the, pursue, and, no, Beatrice, like, no. <laughs> you can do it politely and respectfully, right? But, but, but it's important to pursue answering the questions that you're, that you're interested in, right? That motivate you, that spark your curiosity. Um, because, you know, like you said, I mean, you know, it, may, it makes you happier and, 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 and I'm sure it produces better work also, right? That, that you're much more committed to. 
and you have to bring in the evidence, right? You can't just say, I don't want to do this. You have to say, this is why I want to do this other thing. And this is why I think I can. Right. right? And I think, I think a lot of it had to do with convincing somebody by, by doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, so our next question, um, um, kind of puts pivots the conversation a little bit to talk a little bit more about what's um, uh, happening today or sort of helping us use the past to kind of make sense of the present. Um, so we we're wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your research connects with what's happening in present day Latin America and present day United States um, in terms of the COVID-19 crisis, right? Like what, how does it resonate? It's, I mean, it's, uh, it's challenging um, because it resonates so much, right? So a lot of the same patterns of, uh, of reactions to epidemics, it's, it's kind of, it's interesting to see them in person, live in my life, because having read about the ways in which people reacted to the threat of yellow fever, for example, going from uh, Cuba to the United States in the uh, 1870s, right? That, that threat and that fear and paralyzing and closing of, of borders and quarantining, um, which happens in the 1800s very frequently. And then seeing it happening now, it's, uh, it's a bit jarring, <laughs> but it's very useful, right? Because we, we can then use our knowledge of the ways in which, it, and it's more about the way in which people and societies react to epidemics more than the epidemic and the knowledge of the disease itself that I think is useful, right? So we have these patterns of fear of what's coming from the outside, right? So how do people react and then how do governments react? And the ways in which governments react reflect their, um, their main interests. Um, in moments of crisis, we see what the interests of the state are, and we see also what the weaknesses are. Um, throughout yellow fever epidemics, or throughout fear of typhus, or throughout dengue or Zika, um, it follows a similar pattern. And then it follows with trying to figure out how how to control it, right? So after, after you first have this panic, how do you control it? Um, one of the things that I talk about in my work and, in my, and with my students is that sometimes the panic can be really worse than the disease itself. And the panic causes authorities to hide information, right? To not tell the truth. Um, and obviously that's something that we're contending with right now, not just in this country, but in pe people in Brazil are dealing with this, people in Mexico. Um, there's communities in Mexico that have no idea that the epidemic and the pandemic is going on and that their lives are at risk. Um, so all those things are things that we see historically when we see the different patterns in which epidemics appear and then work their way up until some knowledge of control happens and then diffuse and are diffuse or dissipate. And then what happens afterwards? Um, to be completely honest, I find myself um, very cautious in how I speak about COVID-19 because I, I feel like al although I have all this knowledge about the history of epidemics, I don't know much about this one, right? And I feel that I don't want to say something that is not quite, um, I don't want to be irresponsible. <laughs> in saying something that could affect the way people think about what's going on and then that have that affect their lives, right? So, so I've, been, I, I've had this like push to be active and push to, to speak up. And I'm very kind of careful as to what I'm trying to convey. So as to um, just be upfront and say, I, sometimes you just don't, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> I totally understand that fear or that um, caution. When I started getting calls about, you know, I actually got some calls from media to compare the present day epidemic with, especially with 1918 influenza. I was terrified and I found myself being like, okay, I'll call you back, but in like two days so I can do my homework. Yeah. Um, and I ended up developing actually like a list of things I feel like I can, I can really stand behind that I, 
I know are based in strong evidence, but it is, it is really, it's like you said earlier, all of a sudden historians of medicine and public health are being pushed into the forefront and suddenly people care about our work. Yeah. So it, it does involve some uh, readjusting of how we approach our, our topics. It, it makes us really think hard about how like, every time you write a grant proposal application, you have to say like, why, why should we care? Like, why does your work matter? Like, why should, why should I fund a project that tells me about how knowledge about fever got uh, dispersed in the Caribbean? And so we're constantly trying to justify the humanities like for public good. And this is like one of those moments, right? And it's not easy, but it's something that we can do. Absolutely. So maybe two areas that are relevant to today, but you can speak to through your work um, that I would love to have you talk about. One of them is how pandemics highlight or recreate or increase inequality. So whether it's racial inequality or economic inequality, and also how governments respond to pandemics and how that's different. And I'm especially curious about the difference between on how various Cuban governments have addressed public health compared to other places. Yeah. Um, currently, and, and throughout the 20th century, we see in Cuba a lot of particularly post-revolutionary um, Cuba, um, a government that is um, more authoritarian, right? So like it's, it's a government where uh, dictates from the government are rule and so people follow them and you just do it, right? It's part of the process. And you see that throughout Latin America, depending on the governments, whether they're, um, so there's this like range of democracy where like democracy doesn't exist, right? But, there, but there's like countries that are more democratic than others. And then like working their way towards authoritarianism. So depending on where countries sit at that scale at whatever time period in the 20th century, for example, you see different dictates towards public health. Um, and, and in the case of Cuba recently, what I've seen is that there, um, the statistics that are coming out is that there's quite, um, there's, there's been good control, but then we have to figure out where the those statistics are coming from and, and who they're counting and whether they have their resources to count and treat people, right? Um, I know that they're, uh, that they're working hard towards finding uh, a solution to this problem and to control it in Cuba, but at the same time, it's hard to tell what's going on now. But in past, um, in, the, in the history of Cuba, we see cases of really um, direct control to make sure that things don't get out of hand. Um, and, and so these are kind of the ways in which we can look at how different governments treat epidemics. So not just about whether there's direct dictates towards controlling things, but also whether there's complete, like part of the dictate is to completely ignore it, right? So it could be in, in the case of Brazil, for example, um, it's, it's been the case and in the past in some of these Latin American countries as well, where, um, reactions to disease historically have been to just let it fizzle out and see what happens, particularly when it comes to diseases that don't, don't affect the upper classes, right? And so to move that to the first part of your, your question, how pandemics highlight or, or increase inequality, I think we see that very clearly in the case of Brazil, um, where it's very similar to the United States, right, where people who have access to healthcare and access to educational pods where their kids can um, stay protected while they go to work and where their schools have the resources to test students as well as staff and entire families, um, then, then those people don't feel the effects of an epidemic or a pandemic to the same degree as as people who are out there working because they have to, who are exposed um, through be living in cities or, or just, just the, the situations that they're in where um, their, their living conditions themselves exacerbate the, the way in which viruses are transmitted. In the case of coronavirus, we are learning about these things. Um, in the case of, um, Dengue and Zika, for example, in Brazil, um, you had these 
cities that are very poor in the northeastern part of, of Brazil, just, well, how was it? Was it that decade ago? Like, it was a few years ago, um, where the measures to control Zika um, include putting screens and closing windows. And you can't do that if you don't have a screen and you don't have an air conditioner. Uh, the measures include not having any standing water. And you can't do that if you don't have running water, right? So those are the things that are highlighted when you have these moments of crisis, when you have a, uh, an explosion of, of dengue or Zika or in the past yellow fever, it appears in places where those measures that take money and resources are not being enacted, right? Um, and it has, it has a lot to do with how the government also distributes resources, right? So if it's a government that values public health and it distributes public health resources in a matter that targets the problem areas, then then countries tend to do better in the terms of statistics. Those are really powerful examples. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I wanna um, ask a follow-up to, to that um, conversation, just in terms of, um, you know, I, I like your framing, right? How you talked about that, that oftentimes the government response um, will vary depending on like that, that scale, right? Of democracy to authoritarianism, right? Um, so, so, so that's the government response. What about the organizing amongst people, right? So, so in the absence of government response, sort of what has been um, the people's response, right? Um, society's response in, in the absence of good government response or bad government re response? Um, you see a lot more um, community organization in some places. And I found it particularly uh, recently very striking in the case of Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria hit. So Maria hit three years ago, three days ago. Um, and it devastated the island in incredible ways. It was already under an economic depression. Uh, Puerto Rico is an abandoned colony. Um, it's a colony that remains because uh, colonies used to be profitable and it no longer is. And so it's not even something that the United States even cares about, in my opinion. Um, and, and when Maria hit and the government basically collapsed in its uh, inefficiency and also its uh, bureaucratic mess of corruption, uh, people got tired of waiting and they got tired of waiting to get electricity and they got tired of waiting to get food and they got tired of waiting to get help. And you saw a lot of community organizers um, get groups together to provide for the people in their proximity, right? And community organizations had already been part of Puerto Rican culture before um, and of society. And there's groups of, of feminists, for example, that have organizations in Loisa, of racial justice organizations in the same region of Loisa, um, which is a, 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 a place that is Black Puerto Rican mostly, um, has a legacy of a history of slavery, um, but also a legacy of, of poverty and of being ignored by the, the colonial government, of the, the state government, if you will. Um, but you saw also, um, so, so these organizations that already existed kind of activated and came to the surface. Like a lot of people had never heard of them, that they existed and they came to the surface. Um, another one is that I think of is, um, there's a place uh, up in the mountains that started providing solar power and just really pushed for solar power, which is something that, and other alternative sources of energy, which is something that the government always punished, right? They would charge more if you put solar panels or they would charge you if you decided to put a turbine in your house. And so it, it just was never something that was encouraged because they're just trying to take money away from people. And so these people just went against the government and said, well, we're just gonna provide we're gonna start our own grid, or we're gonna start our own um, community of workers who know how to fix the electrical system, and we're just gonna work together and and help each other because the government is not coming. And that's that's one example that for me is very personal, but it's very striking of the ways in which once the, when the governments are not doing their job, people move up and push against that. 
Yeah, ab absolutely. I think that um, just a, a quick, um, another example, we're, we're working on an oral history project looking at um, Latinos uh, impacted by COVID-19. Um, and one of our partners um, is um, out in New Jersey at Rutgers University. And she talks about a bunch, a lot of, um, uh, uh, that early on in the pandemic, um, a lot of uh, like mutual aid societies basically popped up in, in New Jersey to respond to childcare needs, food needs, um, you know, just basic you know, needs that people had uh, because there wasn't a, a government, uh, uh, you know, there wasn't a state response. Yeah. So I think that that's, um, that, 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 that is common. Yeah. And the state of Puerto Rico, the, 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 the status like and, and, and Puerto Rico itself is interesting because um, you have Puerto Ricans all over the world who then become really active. Mm -hmm. All Puerto Ricans are very passionate about the politics of their island. They might disagree on what they want for the island, but they're very passionate. Like politics is sport on that island. The, the voting, um, the amount of people who vote are really high. Like it's just, it's something that people are really engaged in. And you know all the gossip about all the Puerto Ricans. People all over the world are part of this. And when, when people on the island are in crisis, you have organizations all over the United States who then like move in and start helping their relatives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, we, I mean, I could, we could talk about that for, for a long time. <laughs> um, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll ask another question that'll kind of link, link us back, I think a little bit to something we talked about earlier. And that's, um, you know, you, you mentioned talking about how, you know, your work has become much more relevant, right? And, and, that, and that at times you, you might be reticent to, to share or kind of, I think sometimes people look to historians of public health during this time as kind of like a, for comfort maybe, like tell us how we're going to get out of this sort of thing. Um, Literally, um, I had a journalist ask me that exact question. Yeah, like make me feel better, you know. Um, how did the flu end and how is this going to end? Right. So, so then I think that, 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 that leads us to, to like maybe a, a bigger question, right? Which is, which is, so then what is the role of, the his, of, of historians during public health crises, right? So, so what, what, what's, what is the role, you know, and I, so I'm fairly active on Twitter and there's lots of historians doing lots of different kinds of work on there. Um, some of it helpful, some of it not, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on sort of what, what should we be doing um, during all this? I think that historians are um, are very good at being able to communicate um, why things are important. I think that scientists have a harder time. Um, I think that uh, you know not all of them, of course. These are big generalizations, but I think that um, we've we've had to we're we're better able to convey why some of the scientific things that are happening right now are important, um, whereas in what we hear about epidemiology and science right now are very kind of conclusive and direct things that are being published, but maybe the general public doesn't quite understand it and you have to take their word for it. Um, and I think that we're better able at kind of explaining the process of scientific progress and how, you know, it, it takes time to come up with a vaccine and this is really fast what's been going on. So to put that in words that I feel are more, um, not just approachable to the general public, but something that people can relate to. If you couch this narrative uh, within a history that is familiar to people that they can relate to. So for example, Beatrix, you mentioned everything you've been asked by the flu, influenza is something that people think is part of their history, right? So they find it as something that they can relate to. Um, then, then they're better able to understand what they're going through, right? And, and try to figure out what, um, what they're experiencing with the moment, right? So if, if you can read an article about, um, uh, just a really important article about how from the past, like from the 1980s about the AIDS pandemic is very similar to this arc of epidemics and how we can read it as three different acts, um, then we can take that information and say, okay, this is where we feel we're at right now and we're gonna be okay, right? And I think that's part of it. Um, but also I think that it's important to understand the, um, and to be able to identify when we're being manipulated, uh, so that we can make decisions that are better for us individually, right? So we're better able to understand if you're looking at the history of the CDC, or if you're looking at what's coming out, how do people react to information they're receiving? Um, 
and, and to be critical about it and kind of gauge whether things are trustworthy or not, historians are very good at explaining exactly how you look at a document and how you kind of put it in perspective. And then you can make better decisions for your own people, for your own group, right? It's, it's, it's tough though. It's really tough, right? Is there anyone who you're following or reading right now that, that you found uh, has been particularly helpful or insightful or, or made you feel better <laughs> about what's, what's going on right now? So I don't know if feeling better. Um, I, I try to like, I curate my social media so that I can get away from some of the stresses of one and like go to the other and try to take a break from it, right? Um, I've been follow uh, Peter Hotas and um, from in, in Texas. Um, I think that he is very good at kind of having a positive outlook. Uh, although although he's been very frustrated lately because anything he says is not you know taken care taking account of. But he's been very good at kind of explaining to people why things are important. Um, so I've been following a lot of the epidemiologists. Um, I've been following, um, I to think local ones because the situation in Iowa is, um, is, you know, very much something that's pressing to me and to my family. And so I, I, when the governor is manipulating the health statistics and counting things and not counting others, I want to know so that, you know, I don't go out at night when, you know, all the bars are open in Johnson County. Um, so these are, these are the kinds of things. Yeah. Thank you for including that link to Peter Hotez on the, on the Twitter. Um, but to be completely honest, like I'm trying to um, kind of stay sane for the moment and take care of us right now. And part of that includes shutting things off um, for times of the day. So um, there's a lot of, we're under a lot of pressure and a lot of stress, all of us in this country, I think. And it's coming from many different directions. Um, so I think that a lot, a lot of what I've been concentrated on, like the reason I'm actually really bad at remembering names, so I have to look things up. But that's why I can't like rattle off a bunch of people I'm following. But I'll, I'll know where to find it later. Uh, but I think my the most effort is to make sure that I'm I'm trying to um, survive this, just like everyone else is. Yeah. Thank Thank you for saying that, because I think that that's so true. I think that um, Be Beatrix and I were chatting earlier this week um, and it's and it does seem as though the the deeper we get into this um, the more normal it becomes right and this is just the way we do things now and so we forget to check in on one another or we forget to uh, to say how's it going or to acknowledge that you know um, maybe right like you're curating a social media that maybe doesn't deal with <laughs> with with all <laughs> all this um we we started sort of um uh we have a five-year-old so we had to come up with some code names to talk about things uh when we the five-year-old made a, a a poster and started protesting the coronavirus and we realized that maybe we were talking about this too too, too much um, um at home and we should maybe you know <laughs> you know have some more different conversation um or at home so but but yeah I mean, yes and no, like my, my daughter has similar protest posters on her door. Um, and I think, I mean, some, I think kids can handle some of that information as I'm sure you've realized in your household and it's important to them, right? To understand why they can't go out and play with their friends, right? And it's important to them to also know that this is, what's funny is like at the beginning, like Clara, my daughter Clara asked me, it's like, what did you do when you were a kid and you went through a pandemic? And I said, I can't tell you that, but I can tell you what kids did in the past when they went through a pandemic, right? So like as historians, then we are able to say, look, this past, right? And life was very different then, but, but this, this is the way kids lived in the past, right? So, I mean, it's, they're, they're part of the story. We have a question in the chat, oh, a couple. Um, Leela Porter, who's the, a professor in the anthropology department and a biological anthropologist, and she wants to know about the history of the CDC. 
Uh, have there and have there been previous examples of tension between what the scientists, of the CDC, are saying, what the government is saying? So, where when did the CBC, CDC? Uh, when was it established, and has it always been controversial? Um, I don't I don't know exactly when it was established, so I'm more familiar with an earlier history of of public health. Um, so maybe Beatrix, you will help me out with that one, right? So I'm more familiar with the fact that in the end of the 19th century, um, health and public health was a state right. And it's, it is intrinsically, legalistically a state right. It's very important, right? And there's a moment in the early 20th century where we have a national board of health um, after states are um, arguing with each other because of there's epidemics. So there's like a thread of wars between states. Like there's, there's this like battleships being sent to lakes between states because like people are crossing with yellow fever, right? Um, and it becomes this kind of beautiful, uh, beautiful for a historian, right? Uh, interesting moment um, where all of a sudden um, this realization that perhaps we should think of public health as a national issue within the country, not just about protecting boundaries, right? So there's always been this like national like public health against the outside world, but not within, not, not between states because public health has always been intrinsically a state, right? Now, um, when it comes to something like the CDC, I think it's much later, right? Um, and Beatrix, maybe you can help me out with this because I'm not as familiar with US history on this matter. I, I Googled it, I think it's 1946. <laughs> It's like a lot of things, like World War II made a lot of things more national. And so it, it was the beginning of the nationalization of the idea that the whole government, the federal government should be involved in public health prevention and also uh, research. Yeah. And, and the CDC is really interesting because it's, it's the Center for Disease Control and it's in the United States, but it, it, it has this international body to it as well where it sends experts to, to do international public health campaigns, right? So they're very important towards the eradication of smallpox, right? The CDC experts and scientists get out to other parts of the world to help other people understand it. So they kind of combine with, with the efforts of organizations like the World Health Organization, um, that is also a post-war thing um, to kind of create this idea of, of a more global sense of responsibility for the health of people in this, in this globe, in this earth. And um, in, in, in terms of how controversial, whether the CDC has previously been controversial, uh, no. I mean, this is unprecedented, what we're seeing now. The CDC has traditionally, at least since 1946, been seen as very politically neutral, staffed by experts, and it was, it's been successful. Like um, the most recent example is the Ebola scare. They basically succeeded in keeping an Ebola outbreak from happening in this country. Um, so no, this has not yeah. happened before. This is something no, really new. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's, it's interesting to kind of see the, the politicization of this particular organization. However, um, I'm thinking here of the work of, of people like Paul Greeno, my colleague here um, at the University of Iowa, who's a historian of medicine in, in South Asia, um, who has written about the ways in which uh, CDC experts have been perceived by others in other parts of the world. And oftentimes it's with suspicion, right? Because, because they, CDC experts are seen as conveying the political values and agendas of the United States when they travel to places that are grappling with, in, in the 20th century, that were grappling with um, Cold War mentalities, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's that still that hubris or the arrogance of we're the best, we have the best public health system and you should do it our way. Yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of the international CDC efforts more recently have been uh, towards creating more communication and incorporation of local knowledge in other parts of the world and kind of buy-in so that you can have more successful, like you mentioned Ebola, so that you can have more successful health interventions, right? So it's not just here are these people who are just dropping off, uh, parachuting in and out and telling us how to do things. It's more here are these experts who we can talk to and share our knowledge with 
so that we can actually do something positive and, and fix what's going on. All right. Should I keep going with the questions in the chat or do you have something you want to jump in with, uh, Christina? No, I, I think we should get to the, the, the chat. Sounds, cool. sounds great. We have really good questions coming in. So. so from Alex Lundberg, a PhD student in history. Uh, I know this may be difficult to answer. These are all difficult to answer. Um, I noticed in your article, you referred to a core periphery paradigm. From a global perspective, how would you describe the differences in the way global pandemics or epidemics that travel between economic cores and peripheries are viewed in these regions, for instance? Uh, US president, current, doesn't hesitate to label COVID-19 the Chinese virus. Historically, is this labeling of diseases as foreign or other something that has pr been primarily seen in what we consider developed regions? Great question. Uh, that is a, a, that is a, a Great question, and um, um, I, I would start by saying that it probably varies by region and by what we're talking about. Um, in, I'm trying to think in Mexico, they, they call it el virus chino, and in Puerto Rico, they also, right? So, and there's, there's the cumbia of the virus chino, or there, there's like cultural manifestations um, of, of how people speak about diseases as othering and blaming others from the outside or even from the inside, right? So if it's something that's coming out of poor populations in Mexico, then like labeling them. Um, the Ebola um, virus is one that's labeled also geographically. So we might not be as familiar with it because we don't know much of the geography of, of Africa, but Ebola is the river, right? So it's, it's, it's very much named geographically. And it's something that, internationally we're trying to move away from so it, it definitely is is something that reveals um how how people who have power of speaking out loud to a general public um have these biases and these political inclinations right i have a colleague um Anne emmanuel byrne who is a scholar of international public health and whenever she talks about influenza it's the kansas flu because that's where it originated, right? And I find that to be very powerful to kind of think about flipping that on the United States when we're always talking about the Spanish flu, um, when it's actually the Kansas flu, if you're actually gonna name it geographically, right? And so we start turning towards um, different names, but the politicization of naming things in colloquial ways and in, in, um, in political speeches or in songs, um, it, it will remain. And I think it's something that will always be, but it definitely reflects that othering. Now, um, when it comes to the, the part of the question about the global periphery paradigm, I think it's more about, it's, it's less about global peripheries as related to each other, but more about othering and kind of trying to um, establish boundaries, right? So when it comes to naming and talking about epidemics and pandemic context, it's, it's about closing off and making sure we're defining an other. Um, inevitably, sometimes that other is going to be um, someplace where there's commercial ties, and usually that could be the economic, political periphery, right? Um, that relationship between former empires or, or hegemonical economic relations as in Latin America, right? So um, diseases that come out of Mexico to the United States or, or things like that, right? So those, those things remain. Thanks for the great questions uh, so far. So from Anne Hanley, who is a professor in the history department. Can you talk more about the history of public health authorities and inequality? Did these institutions address inequality? So not just reinforcing it, but also did they try to do something about it? And if so, was this counter to the broader political agenda? Hmm, that's a, I mean, that's a tough one. Again, it depends on the state. Um, I, I've read this, um, and I'm trying to come up again, like I, I can tell you later, the author, I hate not being able to credit the person as I'm speaking, but on the spot, it's harder. But there's this really interesting example about Chilean public health um, in the 19th century um, when um, it did the war of the Pacific. So, so there's this war between, um, help me here. Um, there's war in the Northern parts of Chile 
between Bolivia, uh, Peru, and Chile, because um, Bolivia doesn't have a coastline and it has these contested territories like the Atacama Desert, which is the northern part of Chile, that is very rich in, um, in resources and minerals that are really good for wars. Um, so it's a, it's a very wealthy region um, for mining and for guano. Um, but anyway, so there's this dispute between these states in the northern part of Chile. And Chile is a really long, skinny country, right? So the center of the state, when we're talking about a recently independent state, is in the capital city. So the reach of the power of the state is very limited, and it relies on uh, politicians uh, from those regions who are usually wealthy landowners representing those regions, but also exerting their power, right? So when the war of the Pacific happens and there's this deployment of troops and people are moving throughout all these different communities, smallpox breaks out. And one of the things that is talked about in Chilean government is creating a public health infrastructure that will reach those remote areas where the people are going back home to, to control the smallpox epidemic, right? However, the people who represent those regions, the political landowner, the, the wealthy landowners who are politicians, are anti-vaxxers. They vaccinated themselves and their families, but they don't want to provide public health infrastructure. Because once you have government infrastructure through public health, when you vaccinate everyone, you count them, you take down where they live. So the centralized government in the capital city would have knowledge of that region that before that particular politician and landowner would have all the control over, right? So it's decentering that particular that particular point of control. So so in that case, in that that and that's one case in Latin American history, um, we see how the history of public health authorities is 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 kind of contested by the same politicians because it's, it's, a, it's an arm of the state that once, it's, once that infrastructure is established can be used for other things, right? So that's, that's one very useful example that, that, I mean, I always draw from. Thank you. Are, are people in the, in the I, don't know, I don't know how the webinar works. Are people able to speak or just put questions in the chat? I think they can just put questions in the chat. Um, okay, because I was just thinking that uh, Dr. Hanley, who asked the, the question. Oh, I can allow Dr. Hanley to talk. Hold on, I can. From Brazil, from Brazil. Yes. Hold on. And she says, that is so. <laughs> uh, so uh, Dr. Hanley, I've, I, you should be able to unmute now if you would like. We're putting you on this on the spot there. To, to <laughs> uh, it looks like I'm unmuted now. Um, okay. Yeah, I know that there's no universal truth to any of these questions or answers. Um, and when you were talking earlier about conflict over war, I also I wrote a book about um, public finance, and so I looked at the uh, money that flowed to public health, public education, safety, and infrastructure. And in some cases, communities were willing to spend their own money to contain disease in other communities so that it didn't spread to them. So there was this altruism that was really self-serving, yeah. but, <laughs> but it, did help, um, it did help protect these communities. And one of the things I, th I think is really important, uh, especially about the late 19th century, um, is the greater scientific knowledge about how diseases spread. And when they found out it can, it's not just contained to poor neighborhoods, <laughs> then it becomes, there's more of an imperative to, to get involved and um, to try to remedy some of the public health challenges in the community. But it, it really, so the examples that I have in mind tend to be more altruistic than negative, but I'm also currently researching the history of the census and push back against the census in Brazil is for the very similar reason that you talked about. They didn't want the long reach of the state into their local authority. And so I wanna just thank you for, <laughs> for giving me that example to include in my own work. And, and I, I just found the, um, the citation for you. Um, so the, the article that I read that it, this is based on is a William Sater, S-A-T-E-R, um, The Politics of Public Health, Smallpox in Chile, and it's in the Journal of Latin American Studies uh, from 2003. So I can include that in the chat at some point. I can't hold that much this much, but I have it here. Uh, I appreciate <laughs> it. You. 
So we, we are at the, the hour mark. And so I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but we, we did have one more question that we were hoping to ask you if you um, will give us just a few more minutes of your time, if that's okay. Of course. Sweet. And I, I would also like to make sure that students have a chance to ask any questions. So especially any undergrad students who haven't um, put anything in the chat, please go, go right ahead in the time we have left. So given that we do have a lot of students here um, and also historians, one of the things that's been especially difficult for historians in the pandemic is we haven't been able to go to archives to do our research. And especially for transnational historians such as yourself, um, it's a really, really, it's a real challenge. So do you have any thoughts like how has this impacted, how has this affected your own research and what what can we do? Are there, um, what do you see historians doing now um, to make up for the lack of access yeah. to our archives? Um, realistically, I haven't been able to do much research um, just because of all the other incursions in, in the time that I'm supposed to be doing research, right? So institutionally in my university, as, as we're all aware, but also in, in life, I think we're doing so many more things now that research is particularly for, for people in, in our careers are is taking kind of a very, a very back burner <laughs> that's been very cold for a while now. Um, I, I, I am at a point in my research where I feel like I've gathered most of the sources that I need to work with. So I'm in the writing stage of it, which is very um, fortuitous. Like I, I, it's, it's very helpful for me. Um, I, I am um, working with some graduate students who have had to stop doing research and have had to try to figure out how to um, how to write with what they have because um, the archives of many parts of the world that we study are not like the archives that many of us are used to so they're not like the British Library and they're not like the National Library of Medicine and the Welcome Center as historians of medicine can rely on just logging on and looking at books and looking at manuscripts there even in those places, there's a lot that hasn't been scanned and available digitally. So I think that we've had this transition on how we do historical research in the last 10 years or more, where so much more has been scanned and digitized that it becomes accessible. Sometimes it's overwhelming because if you're planning a trip, you wanna make the best of it and you don't wanna look at things that you can look at online. So it takes a while to identify which are the things that you need to look at there so that you don't get home and be like, oh, I should have, I could have sat in the coffee shop and done that research, um, which happens often. Um, we can't do that anymore either. Yeah, exactly. So we have to kind of do it at home. Um, but but it's, it's really difficult um, in, in some of the Latin American archives and the Caribbean archives, for example, that don't have the resources to digitize that material. And those, and those projects are on hold. Those projects are on hold. Um, I think that um, one, one strategy that, so I have a graduate student who is starting the writing stage. So at least she's done most of her research and it's based a lot on, um, on oral research. Um, that she can call, but at the same time, there's things that she will never be able to see. And, and just the admittance that that's okay, that you can still tell a valuable story, acknowledging that, that the story could have been different had you been able to see all the sources that you wanted to. I think, I think we're going to have to be more forgiving um, if we want uh, our, our graduate students to succeed and do things like that. Um, I'm also, I'm teaching a a historical methods class for undergraduates. And it's so hard because so much of what I like about teaching this class is the scavenger hunt of our library um, and the tactile feeling and the way a document smells is, is missing this year. Um, and it's, it's very difficult. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, as, as historians, other than, than acknowledging the reality we're living in, um, in our writing and, and, and to our students as well, that to just admitting that it's hard is, is an important step. Thank you. I think it's really important for all of us to hear that. Uh, we do have a question about where is this recording going to be posted? 
Um, so it will be posted uh, most likely um, on one of our social social media um, channels, it, or like on our Facebook page, or on our website. We have to work out the logistics. This is our this is the first time I've remembered to hit record um, on one of these sessions. <laughs> so um, um, so yay for for that. Um, but we will we will share that information with with everyone. Um, the link to where you. can can um, go back and listen and watch this this conversation. It will it will be made available once I figure that out. Um, I, I wanted to share. You mentioned you know the 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 research trip thing. I, I totally did that. I looked up. Uh, I need to go to this archive. Look for this stuff. There was a week between the the trips, and by the time I got there, it had been scanned. <laughs> And so I was like, okay, well, which is, I'm, you know, it's wonderful. Like, I'm really happy yeah. about it. But then, um, and, and it's, I, I think that, um, I think that our students are more used to starting with the online research. Whereas when I did the research for my first book, I, I was allowed a yellow notepad and a pencil at the Biblioteca Nacional in Havana. And that's, I mean, I have a box with that research right and and so and so the 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 ways in which we approach material is very different now mm -hmm. and it and it's something that i wasn't taught in grad school like we've had to learn for a second project and and it's still something i'm struggling with yeah i think i think absolutely i think when you know when beatrix and i were chatting it was we were talking about too like what the the, the future of like transnational scholarship or comparative work is going to look like when when you're you're place bound in 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 certain ways right um, to to access the sorts of sources that you you might need so I think this um, we've um, I think during our time this afternoon we've we've asked we've answered a lot of questions but we've also asked a lot of questions that we just don't we just don't know um, but had some really good conversations around um, all of this. So um, I think I want to, I'll, I'll wrap us up. I want to thank you, um, Dr. Espinosa, for joining us, sharing with us um, all your wonderful um, insights and, and knowledge with us. We really uh, appreciate it. I want to thank everyone um, who attended and who um, asked questions and uh, Dr. Hanley for putting you on the spot there. <laughs> thank you for, for joining us and, and, and being part of this dialogue and, and conversation. And the, um, like I said before, the, the link to this, um, the, the, uh, to this webinar, we'll, we'll share it with everyone. Um, we, we know that um, Zoom saves everyone's information. So we'll, we'll, at the very least, we'll email it out to everyone who attended so that you, you have it. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you for inviting me and it's been fun. Good. I'm, I'm glad this is this was this was pretty pretty awesome. I'm I'm sorry that we can't take you out to to lunch or or to dinner fo fo following this. Um, those are often the the you know where we can sort of probe these questions. You know, something to um, look forward to. Yeah, abso absolutely. It was so great talking with you. You as well, Beatrice. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, so I think it's on me to press the, the end button here to end the meeting for everyone. So thank you all very much and um, good luck. Stay safe, take care of yourselves, take care of your families. Um, and if you need anything, uh, please reach out to the Center for Latino Latin American Studies because we're here to help you all. Thank you. <laughs>